Any questions about anything before we start? Now, how long has it been since Andrew Knauss has been here? He might come today. He's been busy with the CUR stuff. Okay. Okay. Well, I hope you've been watching. No. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not picking on you particularly, Andrew, because there's a lot of regulars who haven't been here a lot lately. But <clears throat> anyway. Okay. No questions? <clears throat> okay. So let's pick it up where we were last time. And last time I was talking about the fact that if in general you have a game, it has more than one Nash equilibrium. So game theory by itself, sort of a priori, doesn't provide a way to sort of pick between multiple Nash equilibria as plausible solutions to the game, so to speak. And to that end, that's one thing game theory doesn't provide for. And there's going to be another big one that we're going to talk about today. But remember, last time we talked about supplying game theory with a way to do that over the years, people have looked at equilibrium refinements. And I gave you two examples of those, strict Nash equilibria and Zelton's so-called trembling hand perfect Nash equilibria. Those are just two examples of many took steps in that direction. Of various degrees of satisfactoriness. Like there are all the, there's all these different refinements, like I said, stable, proper, this, that, and the other thing. And you can prove that every game has at least one trembling hand perfect Nash equilibrium. Every game has at least one proper, but not every game has at least one strictly stable, blah, blah, blah. There's chapters of books and lengthy proofs and all that kind of stuff having to do with these equilibrium refinements. But really, they were just a step in the direction of trying to figure out how to select Nash equilibria that are, in some sense, better than other Nash equilibria in games. And one thing I didn't mention last time, I'll just note it down. It turns out that a strict Nash equilibrium is also trembling hand perfect. And in fact, all the equilibrium refinements hold for a strict Nash equilibrium. In some sense, strict Nash equilibria are ironclad good solution concepts for games. And there's, there's a book by this guy, Van Dam, which is a re really good book that has a lot of these intricate discussions of various refinements. And he has these charts, these implication charts in the back of the book that show what implies what. Like, if it's proper, does it necessarily mean it's trembling hand perfect, et cetera. And strict is at the top of the food chain. Strict points to things that point to everything else. So strict is really good. OK, so another thing that game theory doesn't provide is some account of how players, quote unquote, learn to play. And when I say learn to play, I mean not just learn what strategies to use in a game, but also like learn the structure of the game. You know, learn what the payoffs are, etc. In particular, how do they acquire common knowledge? That's really the biggest question, but the one that's swept under the rug the most. How do they acquire common knowledge of the game structure and figure out how to deal with it? OK, so that's a really big missing item. And because of these two criticisms, and also because of the fact that game theory 
usually deals with very small things as opposed to big things. The early history, so early on, and when I say early on, I mean all through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and most of the 80s. So 50s through most of the 80s. Economists, economists kind of ignored game theory as a useful thing, a useful tool for economics. So economists didn't buy in to game theory as being quote unquote economically useful. And that's despite the fact that the very first game theory book by von Neumann and Morgenstern, which was published in 1947, was called The Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. They were trying to develop a mathematical way of understanding how economic agents behave. And economists said, well, the, the economy is too big to understand in terms of these little playthings, these little models. And also, they don't have anything, to, they don't have any account of how you pick between equilibria, you know, any account of how players learn to play. And if you read the way economists wrote about this, it wasn't so much hostile. You know, it wasn't so much like game theory is dangerous and it's stealing our research money or something like that. It was more like condescending. It was more like, you know, oh, the cute game theorists, bless their hearts, that kind of thing. You know, but, but we can't use any of this in real life. Okay. So anyway, people tried to correct the first defect by these equilibrium refinements, and how do they try to treat this, correct the second defect? So one approach, and this occupied, so this is one approach toward the learning to play issue, and this was something that occupied a lot of game theorist times through the 70s and 80s. And there's a huge literature on this, was to study repeated games. And as we'll see, I, I just want to talk briefly about the repeated game thing. You've already met this in the context of the iterated prisoner's dilemma. But as we'll see, studying repeated games isn't really a good account for how players learn to play. And it doesn't solve that problem with game theory. So the setup is as follows. You have one strategic form game. For example, the prisoner's dilemma, whatever, matching pennies, hawk dove, battle of the sexes, all those things we've been talking about. One of those, and we call that the stage game. And you have a single set of agents that play the stage game one time after another, and each time they play it, they observe the outcome. Okay, so a single set of agents, players, plays the stage game repeatedly and observes the outcome of each play. <clears throat> and then they play the game again. Now in the book, in the first chapter, even in the book, you, you met the so-called iterated prisoner's dilemma. So, so one canonical example is the iterated prisoner's dilemma. or IPD. So I want to talk about that for a couple minutes. So you have two agents, the same two agents every time. They play the prisoner's dilemma. They, they observe what happens. Then they play it again, and they observe what happens. And they play it again, and observe what happens. Now we've seen already that if two agents play the prisoner's dilemma once, then the unique Nash equilibrium, and it's strict, it's, it's, it's everything you would want of that game is for both players to play D. Okay, so you may say, well, what if they play it again and again, and over time they learn about each other? Might they be enticed into playing C? 
because that's better for both players, that kind of thing. Okay, so here's a question. As opposed to the one shot, PD might the IPD feature Nash equilibria. And why should an iterated game, why should a repeated game feature Nash equilibria? Well, you can think of a repeated game as just one big, huge strategic form game whose strategy space is much larger than the one-shot game. And you've counted up the strategies for the iterated prisoner's dilemma on some of the homework problems. So you can talk about Nash equilibria for repeated games. So when might it feature Nash equilibria in which players play C sometimes? And so let me just note, technically, mathematically, the IPD and other repeated games <clears throat> are just big strategic form games. There's lots of strategies. For example, tit for tat is a strategy. Or play C on the first step and play D forever after that. That's a strategy. They're just big strategic form games. Therefore, we can talk about Nash equilibria. So how many people think that the iterated prisoner's dilemma features Nash equilibria in which players play C sometimes? It's a trick question. <laughs> so you put, <laughs> OK. So now I'll refine the question. How many people think that the IPD with a fixed finite number of stages features Nash equilibria in which one or more of the players play C sometimes. Okay. I, th I, I count that as one yes and all the rest abstentions. <coughs> all right, well, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Suppose you're playing the IPD And there's a fixed finite number of stages. Call it capital K. So say that two players are playing the K stage IPD. Okay. There's lots of strategies for this game. A typical strategy is going to be a choice for what you do on the first stage of action, or even a mixed strategy, and then a choice of strategy on the second stage that depends on the outcome of the first stage and also perhaps on what you played in the first stage and so on and so on and it goes down the line and the space of strategies grows very huge very fast okay now let's look at the last stage look at stage K what the player plans to do on stage K can depend on everything that's happened up to now. But it can't affect the payoffs that have happened up to now. So a player's strategy for stage K can't affect the payoffs that have occurred so far. Right? It can only affect the payoff on stage K. And no matter what the history is up to then, no matter what payoffs have occurred so far, a player who wants to maximize his or her payoff on stage K is going to do what? Play D. OK. So thus, no matter what, sequence of outcomes has proceeded stage K both players 
are going to want to play D on stage K. And I'll just say, we'll play D on stage K. All right, now let's look at stage K minus 1. Yeah? Um, in game theory in general, is there ever a notion of you know the other player will cooperate if you cooperate? Something along those lines? There is cooperative game theory, but that's, we're not talking about that. There's cooperative game theory, there's team formation in multiplayer games, there's games with pre-play communication, and some of you have sent me a link to a TV show in Britain called uh, Steel or Share, or is it Share or Steel? Has, has anyone in the room here today sent me that? Somebody sent, yeah, somebody sent it to me a few years ago, and, and then it's basically a prisoner's dilemma at the end of the game. You know, you, each player has a, has a choice as to whether to split the pot with the other player or steal the pot. If they both elect to steal, neither of them gets anything. If one steals and the other elects to share, then the stealer gets the whole pot. If they elect to share, they split it in half. And there are, this game has many outcomes, all the different outcomes are possible and that have, have actually happened on the show. Drew, you had your hand up. I if the iterated prisoner's dilemma has the same magic for you to play K or play D in any stage of K, then how does Tit for Tat do so well in a series of iterations? It just doesn't play D all the time. Well, Tit for Tat is not a Nash equilibrium against itself which means that a player playing tit-for-tat could improve his payoff by playing D on every stage, or, or D on the last stage. Does this suggest that a strategy that's played D at every stage would be better than pretty much any other strategy? In this it, it doesn't say that it will be, do better than any other strategy any more than playing D on the one-shot game does better than any other strategy. It just does better for each player no matter what the other player is doing. Whereas if they both played C, both would do better, but we're only looking at one player choices. Look, one, each player has to stare at the game and say, do I want to change what I'm doing here? Independently of the other players. Okay, the, the, your question is, is good, but it's complicated. It, it has to do with this whole idea of two players changing at once versus one player changing at once. But anyway. Okay, but anyway, the, the bottom line is that at the last stage, both players will play D, no matter what the past history was. Now, now the players are looking at stage D minus one, or K minus one. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention the payoffs in this repeated game are just summed over stages. So, so just stick that in. The payoff are just summed over the stages. So if you play C, C on the first stage and D, D on the second stage, you get four, each player gets four and so on. Okay, now at stage K minus one, again, what the player chooses to do can depend on the whole past series of outcomes but can't affect it. There's no effect on what's happened before. So the player's plan can't affect what's happened before and the player knows that he's going to play D on stage K no matter what comes out of stage K minus 1. So the players know or each, let me put it in individual player terms because that's more like game theory. Each player knows that he'll play D on stage K no matter what happens in stage K minus 1. So, in effect, what game are the players looking at? So, in effect, the players are looking at this game. If they play CC, if, they, if, if, if the outcome is CC, they're going to get three on stage K, but they know they're going to get one on stage K 
the last eight. So I have four, four. If I play, these are D's, sorry. If I'm a player here and I play D and the other plays C, I get five now, but I'm going to get one later. And this player is going to get one on the last stage. And this is what the game looks like. Okay. See where that comes from? Each player knows they're going to get one on the last stage. So all you do is you take the prisoner's dilemma matrix and you add one to every payoff for each player. And that's the game they're looking at at stage k minus one. Now if you look at this, this is just the prisoner's dilemma all over again. Because if I'm player one, no matter whether player two is planning to play C on stage K or D or K minus one or D on stage K minus one, I do better by playing D. Six beats four, two beats one. Okay. So the, this one has the unique choice, unique Nash equilibrium of play D, play D. is the unique Nash equilibrium of that game. Yes, Rahul. In this case, each prisoner's dilemma was because we knew that we're playing D, the very last. Yeah. What if it was, it was not set, but you were looking at like two stages by themselves? Would you add all the payoff? Instead of being 4-4, four, four, it would be 6-6, six, six, um, 10, 0, 0, 10, and then 2-2? Well, it's a, little, it's a little more complicated than that because there's, there's different possible outcomes. There, there's, there's CC, comma, CD. You know, there's more than just four. Right. But, so we, we you have to make four different matrices and look at them individually? Well, you make one huge matrix if you want to do it that way. Okay. But, but this, is, this is a way of paring down the mathematics so you don't have to look at a huge matrix. Right. And I'll get to you in a second, Pat. Okay. So okay. But when you make that one huge matrix, that's a... a Matrix within a matrix, right? You have individual. Not, not, it's not going to be an obvious matrix within a matrix. It's technically the IPD is just one huge strategic form game. How many strategies are for, are for the two stage IPD? There's a choice of action on stage one. And then, depending on the outcome of stage one, there's a choice of action on stage two. So there's two to the fourth. Okay, so there's 17 total pure strategies, or something like that. Matt question, or 32 actually. So when you're looking at the Nash equilibrium for K minus 1, are you kind of, are you allowed to like make the assumption that you know that the other player is also going to play D? That's where common knowledge comes in. You, you know how you reason and you know that the other player knows the structure of the game and will reason similarly. Okay. But there, there are other ways, there are, there are ways of avoiding that, but this is just the quickie way, the quickie math proof. This process that I'm going through now is called backward induction. Okay. okay. And it has its flaws and it has its detractors, but but it's rigorous. Robert. You're you're assuming that every player is a copy in the sense that he or she wants to maximize his or her payoff. You're assuming that you have each each player behaves rationally in the sense of wanting to maximize payoffs. Okay, that's that's the only the only identicalness you're assuming between players. But it's enough, because that's really the only... At some point, it seems like if there's, if you share enough as far as strategy, which it seems like you share a lot of the decision making and the strategy, like if you're playing like this game against yourself, I feel like you would know to choose C. Okay, you can't play it against yourself because you can't be going off into a room and not know what the other player is doing, which is what you have to think about you know, the, the way we think about the players making their decisions, they go off into a room, they look big, they make their decision, they stick it in an envelope, they give it to the referee. And if you're the other player, then you know what the other player is doing in his room, and that's not fair. Oh, I'm saying like an identical copy of you. Um, Parallel universes. Yeah. Whatever. I, yeah, okay. I, I'm not sure I want to go there just yeah. now. Okay. Why you added one on all the Because of this. 
Both players will play D on stage K, therefore in stage K, no matter what they do on stage K minus 1, they will each get 1. And therefore, depending on what they do at stage, these are the stage K minus 1 actions for the two players. If this is what they do on stage K minus 1, both play C, they'll get 4 total over the last two stages. And when we talk of payoffs, is it generally true that your strategy has a higher payoff than the strategy? A mixed <coughs> Generally, well, the thing is that if in equilibrium, every pure strategy that a mixed strategy mixes over is going to have the same payoff against the opposition strategies. Right. But when we have the games that we consider, mm -hmm. we have, say, for instance, two pure strategies and one mixed strategy, right? Um, right. Generally, always the pure strategy had a higher payoff. No, not always. So it's not necessarily that bad. Right, right, right. right. Although, you know, you might be having, you might have a game in mind for which the answer to your question is yes. So I, you know, I, I don't want to, like, muddy the water by... <clears throat> but the bottom line is, if you, the last two stages, both players are going to play D. And so it goes. As you go back stages, backward induction through all the stages, So thus, both players play D on stage K minus 1 for all histories, etc. And you conclude that the only Nash equilibrium outcome for this game, and I want to emphasize that, is, quote, play D on every stage. Both players. Now, when I say Nash equilibrium outcome as opposed to Nash equilibrium strategy profile, the distinction I'm drawing is that there are many different strategy profiles that will lead to this Nash equilibrium outcome. So note many strategy profiles, including the nihilistic strategy profile, play D on every stage no matter what for both players, lead to this outcome. Here's a simple one, besides nihilism. Play D on stage one, and play tit for tat after that. What's going to happen if both players follow that strategy? So e.g., each player plays, quote unquote, play D on stage one, and tit for tat thereafter. That's going to happen. All these are going to come out. So, so the point is that there's, there's zillions of Nash equilibrium strategy profiles, but just one possible Nash equilibrium outcome in the finitely repeated prisoner's dilemma, unfortunately. Whatever. <clears throat> OK, now let me just pause here and, and mention this process of proof here is called this proof was based on what game theorists and what others call backward induction. It's kind of like a game theoretic version of dynamic programming almost, you know. But, but backward induction is a little bit dangerous, can be dangerous. And, and how many people have heard of the, from, the, from logic, the, the surprise test paradox? How many people have heard of that, Cameron has? Right. Right. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah. The, the, everything you said was right on except for the first thing. It can't be on the last day 
because then it wouldn't be a surprise. Right. Yeah. Okay, here's the, let me, let me explain what he just explained. For those of you watching at home, we probably can hear the people in the audience. Through the <laughs> okay. Professor says on Friday, okay, in class, one of the days in class next week, they have class every day, so it's like a foreign language class or something. One of the days in class next week, I will give you a surprise test. Now, what does he mean by that? What's a good interpretation? Well, the good interpretation of what a surprise test is, is A, it's a test, and B, when you arrive at class that day, you won't know whether you're going to have a test that day until the professor says, you're going to have this test now. Okay, so clever student, clever student, you know, goes home over the weekend and thinks about this, thinks about, okay, can she give it on Friday next week? Well, no, because, because if she hasn't given it Monday through Thursday, then she has to give it Friday, right? And therefore, as of Thursday night, I'm going to know that the test is going to happen on Friday. Therefore, it can't happen on Friday. Okay, so it's got to happen on Thursday or earlier. <laughs> okay, so can it happen Thursday? Well, I know it can't happen Friday. You know, see? See how it unravels? Okay, so philosophers talk about this all the time, the surprise test paradox. And you have to, to solve that problem, you have to use temporal logic, you have to use all kinds of other reasoning. And, but take my word for it, that kind of danger does not arise in this situation. Okay. Now briefly, what about, remember I, I refined my question about, as opposed to the one shot might the iterator prisoner's dilemma, blah, 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 by saying a fixed finite number of stages. What if? What if the players play it an infinite number of times and the payoff is the time average payoff over all the stages? So let's look briefly at the infinitely repeated version. And this is what a lot of the work that I was uh, talking about in the 70s and 80s was on, was infinitely repeated games. So what about the infinite IPD? Okay. So how do we define the payoffs? Payoff to player i is equal to limit as k goes to infinity of the sum from k equals 1 to capital K of the payoff to i on stage k. And I have to divide Okay, so it's the time average payoff, limiting time average payoff. Now caution, players can always play so that this sum doesn't, this, this limit does not exist if they play in really perverse ways. Like if they both play C for one stage and then they both play D for two stages and then they both play C for four stages and you exponentially increase like that, you're going to find that the sum doesn't converge. But Assuming they play so that the sum converges. So the limit exists. So it's not always true that the limit does exist. OK, but assuming they do, I'm going to propose a Nash equilibrium for this game. And this one is in the handout. These are both in the handout. So here's one Nash equilibrium of this infinite game. Each player employs this strategy. Play C on stage one. and continue playing C until the opponent plays a D. And let's call this phase one of the game. And then if the opponent plays D, Enter phase two. And phase two 
is play D forever. Okay, so both players are employing that strategy. And Peyton Young, H. Peyton Young, who's an economist at Johns Hopkins, who's done a lot of work in evolutionary game theory, calls this <clears throat> the grim strategy for the infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. I usually just call it the relentless punishment strategy, but whatever, you know. Okay, so what if both players employ that strategy? What happens during the game? What happens if both players follow that strategy? Vincent. What's that? They cooperate, they cooperate forever, right? Because each one of them waiting, is waiting for the other one to play D. And if the other one never plays D, he's never going to play D. And vice versa. Thus, both players stay forever in stage one of their strategy, and they cooperate forever. And if they cooperate forever, what's their limiting average payoff? So if both players follow, follow this, the outcome of the game is CC on every stage. And the payoff to each player is what? This is the payoff. It's the limit of the average over the first k stages of the payoff to each player on stage k as k goes to infinity. What is that if cc happens on every stage? Yeah, the, the payoff to each player is 3. Okay? Now that's, that's a Nash equilibrium because why? What if either player deviates from the strategy. What's the only way to deviate from the strategy? The only way to deviate from the strategy is play D first. Right? At some point. Once a D gets played, game over. Well, game continues, but in a nasty fashion. Okay. D is played by both players for every stage after that. So this is this strategy profile. is a Nash equilibrium because why? If, say you're player one, deviates from it, what that means is that he plays D at some point, at some finite point in time, after which both players, or after which the other player, player two, by following the strategy, will play D forever. Okay, and what does that mean for player one? That means that the payoff to player one, who has deviated from this strategy unilaterally, is going to be the average, the limiting average of what? Well, it's going to be a bunch of threes until he deviates, right? He plays D, and the other player plays C, so he gets five. And then after that, a bunch of things that are less than or equal to one. Because player two is playing D on all these stages. So player one can get at most one. He gets that by playing D. If he plays C, he's going to get zero. So even if he's very apologetic and, oh my god, I didn't mean to play D, please play C again. No, player two is still playing that strategy of play D forever, right? 
Bummer. Okay. So when you take the infinite average of a finite number of threes plus a five plus an infinite number of things that's less than or equal to one, what do you get? You get something that's less than or equal to one. Thus, player one cannot profit by deviating from this strategy. And similarly, player two can't profit by unilaterally deviating from that strategy. And that's exactly what it means to be in Nash equilibrium. You can't profit by deviating from the strategy you've planned to play if the other players play according to the strategy they're planning to play. Okay, so the conclusion. The strategy above is a best reply to itself, i.e. it, comma, it is a Nash equilibrium. Okay? All right. Now, you saw here that there's no way for this to return to cooperation if the players play these this strategy, if both players play this grim strategy or this relentless punishment strategy. And really that's not what happens in the world, you know, like when people are playing Prisoner's Dilemma again and again, infinite number of times. Here's another, another Nash equilibrium for the infinitely repeated IPD. Each player plays the following strategy. And again, it's going to have two phases. Phase one, or actually, well, uh, there's various ways of phrasing it. So let me, various ways of phasing it. No, sorry about that. Play C. OK, uh, Paul? Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Yep. Well, what what you've just proved, what you've just proved is that playing C on every stage is not a Nash equilibrium for the finitely K stage prisoner's dilemma. Because playing C on every stage, you can always improve your payoff against that strategy by playing D on the last stage. But the, but the thing about the infinite one is that there's infinitely many stages after that that wash out whatever gain you had on, okay, Drew? Yeah, it has to be infinite. No, because then pl the, well, each player could improve by playing D on the second to last stage. <laughs> See, it, it just unravels stage by stage. And yeah, exactly like the surprise test. OK. All right, so phase one is play C. And you keep doing that if the opponent plays D, enter stage two, phase two. What is phase two? You play D for two stages and then return to phase one. Okay, now before we prove that that's Nash equilibrium, tell me what happens in the game if both players follow that strategy. They just, cooperate. they just cooperate. Because each one is waiting, each one is playing C until he sees a D from his opponent. But since the other opponent is playing that strategy too, 
He's playing C until he sees a D from his opponent. Therefore, neither one ever plays C, just like in the other one. Okay, so just as, just as in the relentless punishment situation, if both players play according to this strategy, the outcome of the game is cooperate forever, and the average payoff to each player is three. So as before, if both players play this way, outcome is CC on every stage of the stage game, and payoff equals three to both players, a long-term average payoff. All right. Now, why is it a Nash equilibrium? To show it's a Nash equilibrium, you have to show that neither can profit by deviating from the strategy. And what does deviation from this strategy entail? It entails playing D first at some point, right? And maybe playing D again later on, whatever. So why is this a Nash equilibrium? Say I'm player one. So player one deviates from it. And how does player one deviate from it? Player one deviates from it by playing D one or more times. OK, so what is, what is the payoff to player one going to look like in that case? The payoff to player one is equal to the average of a bunch of numbers. It's going to be a bunch of threes for a while, and then player one's going to play D first and get five on that stage. And then on the next two stages, he's going to get something less than or equal to one. Because player two is playing according to the strategy and therefore playing D on those two stages. So over these three stages, he gets less than or equal to seven, right? And player one returns to cooperation after that. And even if player two keeps defecting, he's going to get less than or equal to seven on the three stages, including the one in which he plays D. Okay, so every time he plays D, player one is limited to a total payoff over the three stages, starting with the one in which he plays D, of seven. So every time player one plays D, what happens? He gets at most seven over the three stages, starting with the D. OK? Instead of the nine he would have gotten, by sticking with the program. OK? Now, player one can return to playing C and never play D again, or player one can return to playing C for a while and play D again, and the same thing's going to happen for the next three stages. There's a little punishment phase. But over the long haul, over the long haul, you see that player one cannot get more, cannot get more than three on the average by deviating from this program, deviating from this strategy. So thus, there's no way for player one over the long haul to improve his payoff from three by 
deviating from the program. And again, the conclusion is that the best reply, that strategy is the best reply to itself. It, it is a Nash equilibrium of this game. And the good thing about this is that cooperation can be restored. Okay. Like suppose someone accidentally plays D. Suppose that you have to, you know, like in playing that 2048 that you guys have saddled me with. Okay. Sometimes I'll look at it and I'll say, all right, I want to move to the right, but I hit my left arrow by mistake. Damn. You know, <laughs> you, you know, you know what I'm talking about in that game. Okay. And I, by the way, I've made it to F Shari. <laughs> no, no, he's 512. So there's two left. There's two left. <laughs> anyway. Does everybody get this? Drew. That, that's a, you, can, you, can, you can vary this in numerous ways. The way that people vary it is saying, well, suppose there's a discount factor, like in economics, like dollars you get next week count less than dollars you make this week. And you, you d instead of having this, this infinite time average payoff, you have the discounted average payoff. There's a whole theory of repeated games for that. And you could prove that the discounted payoff model is the same as playing it a, fix, a finite number of times where, the, where the, it's a random process what the, what the last stage is. Okay, so everybody flips a coin, and if it comes up heads, they stop. If it comes up tails, they keep playing. And that's where the discount factor. So, so there's a theory for those too. Oh yeah, there's. The, the, I was. I'm about to say there's the whole theory of repeated games. You you can see that it's kind of even difficult to describe in this very simple setting the kinds of strategies you see. If you look at the theory of repeated games, which took 20 years to develop, there's hugely complicated strategies, like play this action up to now, unless the other players play this action, in which case you flip a coin and do this, and you know, the, the answers are elaborate. You know, and, and you can prove that, that there, are certain, there are theorems called the Nash Folk theorems, that every achievable payoff is supported by an equilibrium in the infinitely repeated game with discounting, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, so I, can, I can point you to numerous references on that if you're interested. But does everyone get why, first of all, if both players play according to this strategy, then they never enter stage two, phase two? And second of all, why neither player can improve his payoff by deviating from that strategy? And the only way to deviate from it is play D one or more times. OK, good. So anyway, yes? No. No, like in Hawk Dove, a Nash equilibrium is I play Hawk, you play Dove. Okay. So let me just the bottom line is that there's that there's a whole theory of repeated games. You can write books and books on this stuff. And and it's fun to read. Okay. So there's a whole theory. repeated games and that theory is replete with elaborate strategies involving punishment as in play D every stage after the other guy plays D reward coin flips Etc. Okay, now what's wrong with that picture from our standpoint? Well, what's wrong with that picture is that people started studying these things as a way of trying to understand how people grope and learn how to play games, right? And clearly, they don't do it by coming up with these huge elaborate plans, okay? They mess around, right? Okay, so this is not a good model. quote unquote, for learning to play. Okay. Which is what the original intent of studying them was. Yeah. Did 
I don't know, actually. I forget, when Axelrod did the experiments, did he have a random number of stages? I forget. Yeah, I, I really, I don't know the answer to your question, actually. I have to look. Axelrod's book is fun to read, by the way. It's very thin. It's, it's not TLDR kind of thing. You know, it's the kind of thing you can actually read. It's called The Evolution of Cooperation. Okay, but the bottom line is repeated games are not a good way to model learning to play. And this kind of study of all these elaborate strategies, punishment, reward, that's what engenders the economists going, you know, oh, the cute game theorists, good math, fun stuff, but really not very useful, not, not something that we can use in the real world. Okay. All right, so let's take the three-minute break, and then we'll talk about, we'll start talking about the evolutionary stuff and how that takes care of some of these problems. This repeated game thing with other games, like for example, if you do with the Battle of the Sexes, let me just run run a quick one by you here. Okay, so you, let's one last thing because this sort of appears in the homework a little bit. Consider the repeated, say, K stage Battle of the Sexes game. Okay. All right. So can anyone propose some Nash equilibria for the K-stage repeated battle of the sexes? I'm thinking of, of like three particular ones. K-stage, where K is fixed. Okay, how about this? Is this a Nash equilibrium strategy profile? So here are three Nash equilibria. You look like you're walking in front of a movie, you know, like a theater to get out of the way. <laughs> okay. So it's the reverse of a movie. It's like the, the light flow is in that direction rather than this direction. Okay. Three Nash equilibria. One, both players. Play C every stage. Is that a Nash equilibrium? Yeah, I'm telling you it is. Can you see why? What's the only way for a player to deviate from that strategy? Say player one. He's, it's to play B on some stage instead of C. Well, one or more stages. And if the other player is playing the strategy, play C on every stage, you playing B is only going to cost you. And similarly, both players play D or B on every stage. That's a Nash equilibrium. Now, what about this one? What about the, the sort of more sharing equilibrium? Both players play the following strategy. They play C on even numbered days and B on odd numbered days. I claim that's also a Nash equilibrium. Because the only way a player can deviate from that strategy is by playing, say, C on an odd number day or B on an even number day. And if the other player is playing according to that strategy, that's only going to cost the deviator. <coughs> right? So the deviator will never do it. And there's zillions of others. There's zillions of others like that. One that isn't a Nash equilibrium is play your favorite outcome on or your favorite thing on even number days and the opponent's favorite thing on odd number days because then you end up in a death spiral where you're both disagreeing. You're both, you know, you're never doing the same thing together. Okay, anyway, so repeated games, not a good model for learning to play. So anyway, the game theorists went on, did all their stuff, and around 1970, a British evolutionary biologist named John Maynard Smith. And this is one of those names, one of those British names that his, his last name is Maynard Smith, but it doesn't have a hyphen. Okay. You know, that's how some British names are. They're like two words that don't have a hyphen. 
Okay. So this is a, a British evolutionary biologist discovered game theory. And it occurred to him that perhaps he could use game theory to model in a very simplified way some of the kinds of processes that go on in natural selection. So he, he wanted to, he, he saw the relevance of game theory to natural selection. Why? Well, it has an endogenous fitness function, so to speak. That if you have a population of players playing some game and some of them are doing better than others, then maybe they reproduce more, et cetera. Their payoff is in terms of how many children they have, whatever. So he, he saw the possibility of using it to model in a, in a very simple way some sort of simple simple features of natural selection. And the key idea he came up with was this idea of what he called an evolutionary sta evolutionarily stable strategy. Okay, so the key idea, and this is the very first idea in evolutionary game theory, is the idea of an evolutionarily, evolutionarily stable strategy, or ESS. And if you, if you search on ESS, see if that comes up as the first hit. It's a little bit too generic an acronym. Ah, bummer. OK. All right, what's the setup? The setup is the setup is that you have what's called a two-player symmetric game. OK, so, so you start with a finite two-player symmetric game. Now, what does a symmetric game mean? A symmetric game is a game where each player has the same action set. So symmetric means symmetric game. First of all, each player has the same action set, capital A. So we don't have to worry about A1 through A2, or A1 through A, and it's a two-player symmetric game. So we're only dealing with two players. And there's a single payoff function. And this piece of chalk has a defect in it that's going to cause some really, really grating sounds in a minute. So I'm going to get another piece of chalk out. All right, payoff's determined. by a single function, a single two-variable function, u, as follows. u of a comma a prime is equal to the payoff to an a player against an a prime player for all actions A and A prime in the action set A. So that's what a two person, a two player symmetric game is. Among the, yeah, Paul. Uh, what was the first? What was the first modifier? What does that mean? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. It, that's that's an extensive form game. Yeah, there's always a pure strategy Nash equilibrium in those games. But it's that's different because 
because there's this notion of one player goes, then the other player goes, then the other player goes, then the other player goes. All the games we're talking about are strategic form games where both players move simultaneously, having decided on what to do in private. Yeah. Yeah, no one has found the strategy for chess, by the way. You know, there, but there is one. Everyone knows it's out there. You can prove that, that there is, there is a strategy that either guarantees black will win, guarantees white will win, or guarantees there will be a draw. Anyway. All right, so each player has the same action set A, and this is what it means uh, to, to calculate the payoff. If you're an A player, you just look at what the other guy's playing, and you get U of A comma A prime. Now, among the games we've looked at so far, the prisoner's dilemma is, a, is symmetric. as is the hawk dove. Let's think about that. Like, in the prisoner's dilemma, if I play C and the other guy plays B, D, then I get zero. And that's true for both players, right? Similarly, if, I both, if they both play C or they both play D, they get three or they both get one. So that's symmetric. Hawk dove is the same way. If I'm a hawk and I'm playing against a dove, it doesn't matter whether I'm player one or player two. I get 50. If I'm a dove playing against a hawk, I get zero. And so on. Matching pennies is not symmetric. <coughs> because the playoff to an H player against an H player is not well defined. If you're player one, the payoff to you is one, but if you're player two, it's zero. And the battle of the sexes, as we've stated it, is not symmetric. But we can symmetrize it. We can consider later on, we'll look at a symmetrized version. Okay. And one thing, you know, if you look at a game like one of these games where you can write down the matrix and everything, of course you can for all these two player games, all the diagonal entries have to have same, same, like that, same, same. Because the payoff to an A player against an A player has got to be the same for each player. So if the game doesn't look like this on the diagonal, it's not symmetric. Okay, anyway, that's the setting. And he envisions, Maynard Smith does, so the, the, the sort of the visualize, a large population of players of this game, each programmed to play some mixed strategy of the game. And you may think of this as that's what their genome says to do. Visualize a large population of players, each program to play some mixed strategy for the game. It might be different for different players. Different members of the population. Okay, now, suppose now that you have everybody in the population is playing some particular mixed strategy and it's the same for every player. So the idea here of a monomorphic population would be one where everybody's playing the same mixed strategy, sigma star. Okay, now, 
Maynard Smith says, all right, suppose you had a monomorphic population and somehow or other another strategy appeared. Some players appeared who were playing some other strategy, sigma. And he's silent on how that might happen or how this population might get started at all. So say you start with one of these. So you start monomorphic sigma star. And suddenly, I'll put that in quotes, a tiny fraction of sigma players appears. Okay. And sigma is not equal to sigma star. What will happen? Will the sigmas disappear? They go extinct or will they overrun the population? Whatever. So what happens next? That's the question he asked. And he tried to model this using game theory or using, this, this, using the idea that strategies that disappear are ones that do better at the game, or, or do worse at the game, and strategies that persist are ones that do better at the game. And so that's where we'll pick it up next time. And like I said,